You are listening to Second Chance Ministry Radio. You're listening to the audio production of Parables, the mysteries of God's kingdom revealed through the stories Jesus told, by John MacArthur, published by Thomas Nelson, read by Maurice England. A Lesson About the Cost of Discipleship If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke chapter 9, verse 23 Perhaps the most unnecessary extreme activity is high mountain climbing. Every year, compounding as each year passes, the slopes of Mount Everest are littered with the dead bodies of failed climbers. The effort is costly, all-consuming, and dangerous. Prior to 1996, one in four who made the attempt died in the process. The numbers are a little better today, but still on average, 14 people die for every 100 who reach the summit. One in 10 who do make it to the top die on the way down. More than 225 people have perished in the past three decades trying to make the climb. April 2014 saw the deadliest day in the mountain's history when an avalanche swept 16 people to their deaths. What other sport claims the lives of so many participants? It is an expensive expedition, too, costing anywhere from $30,000 to four times that, just to make one attempt. Training for the climb takes 8 to 12 months full-time, minimally. Several years of climbing experience is considered absolutely necessary by most experts. Considering the high cost of the hobby and the dire outcome that is possible, it is astonishing how many people will risk everything they have, and even their own lives, to accomplish a feat that offers them no tangible reward beyond self-satisfaction and pride. It is certainly not a commitment to be entered into lightly. Our Lord said something similar to those who showed a superficial interest in following Him. Discipleship is not a lifestyle to be embarked on heedlessly. He told two parables in Matthew chapter 13 that illustrate the necessity of counting the cost of entering his kingdom. What is the kingdom? The kingdom of heaven is a frequent theme in Jesus' parables. It is the realm over which Christ himself is the undisputed king of kings and lord of lords. It is the domain in which his lordship is even now fully operative. In other words, all who truly belong to the kingdom of heaven have formally yielded to Christ's lordship. To enter the kingdom, therefore, is to enter into eternal life. In short, the kingdom is synonymous with the sphere of salvation, that eternal realm where the redeemed have their true citizenship. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. At present, the kingdom is a spiritual dominion, not an earthly geopolitical realm. Jesus described the current state of the kingdom as intangible and invisible. The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there. For indeed the kingdom of God is within or among you. Luke chapter 17, verses 20 through 21. He also said, My kingdom is not of this world. John chapter 18, verse 36. This is not the full and final expression of Christ's kingdom, of course. The earthly culmination of the kingdom awaits his bodily return. Then all the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. The first phase of that eternal rule is the thousand-year reign of the Lord Jesus on earth, promised in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 7. That is followed by the creation of the new heaven and the new earth, over which his eternal reign continues. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. That is what Jesus taught us to pray for. 
Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. When the kingdom is finally manifest in the new creation, it will be visible, universal, spanning heaven and earth, and never-ending. In the meantime, the kingdom is absolutely real. It is present, and it is constantly, quietly growing as sinners are redeemed and graciously granted kingdom citizenship for all eternity. Jesus illustrated all those truths in his parables. The kingdom is called by several names in Scripture. The kingdom of Christ and God. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. The kingdom of God. Mark chapter 4, verse 11. And his, Christ's kingdom. Matthew chapter 13, verse 41. And chapter 16, verse 28. The common notion that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are separate realms is a fallacy. Matthew always used the expression, kingdom of heaven, and he is the only writer in the New Testament to use that phrase. All the other Gospels routinely say, kingdom of God. The terms are synonymous, as you can see by a comparison of cross-references. Compare Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, and Luke chapter 6, verse 20. Matthew chapter 19, verse 24, and Mark chapter 10, verse 23. Or Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, and Luke chapter 7, verse 28. Matthew is writing for the benefit of Jewish readers. He always said kingdom of heaven rather than kingdom of God, because Jewish readers tended to be over-scrupulous about the use of God's name, and he did not want to put an unnecessary stumbling block in his reader's way. Is entrance to the kingdom free, or is there a cost? Nothing in the universe could ever match the priceless value of the kingdom. It's worth more than any mere mortal could ever imagine, which means it is infinitely beyond the price range any of us could ever even think to afford. If you gave everything you ever had, and everything you ever will have, it still would be nowhere near enough to merit entry into the kingdom. This is crystal clear in Scripture. You simply cannot buy your way in. In fact, it actually works the other way. People who are rich in this world's goods are severely disadvantaged from the perspective of the heavenly kingdom. Jesus said, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 19, verse 24. Scripture says, The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. To be enthralled with material wealth makes a person unfit for the kingdom, even if the person isn't wealthy. In Jesus' words, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. Mark chapter 10, verse 24. Nor does the kingdom belong to self-righteous people, or those who think their religion, morality, education, humanitarianism, philanthropy, environmentalism, political viewpoint, or anything else might earn merit with God. Compare Luke chapter 18, verses 10 through 14. The demand of God's law is very straightforward. Jesus summed it up in a single statement. You must be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. James says it this way, Whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. James chapter 2, verse 10. So the law condemns us all, because we all fall short of that measure. It is the very height of arrogant presumption to imagine that fallen sinners could sufficiently satisfy God's perfect standard of righteousness, or somehow win his favor by trying to cover our guilt with our own imperfect works. We are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. We could sooner buy all the palaces and mansions on earth than we could earn entry into the kingdom of heaven by our own merits. In fact, the characteristic attitude of all true kingdom citizens is that they are poor in spirit. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. They recognize and confess their own utter spiritual poverty. 
They know that they are unworthy sinners. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. That, by the way, is not one of the kingdom mysteries kept hidden until it was finally revealed in the New Testament. It is a basic truth that should have been perfectly clear already. Those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him, for the redemption of their souls is costly. Psalm 49, verses 6 through 8. That's why Jesus, the perfect, spotless, sinless Lamb of God, had to make the only possible atonement for sinners. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. In effect, Christ paid the kingdom's entry fee in full for those who believe on his name because he is the only one who could ever pay such an unimaginably high price. And it was indeed an exorbitant price, worth infinitely more than all earth's gold and material riches combined. You are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18-19 through 19. He paid the price in full. That's what his final words on the cross signified. It is finished. John chapter 19, verse 30. By one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. Therefore, all who enter the kingdom do so freely, without money and without price. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1. By grace through faith, not by any merit or virtue of their own. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. Yet, as we are about to see in this pair of pithy illustrations, genuine faith never fails to appreciate the true cost of salvation, what our deliverance from sin's curse and bondage cost Christ, what it means to be bought by Christ and bow to his lordship, and above all, how valuable redemption is in terms of its eternal worth to the sinner. Further and paradoxically, though the Lord Jesus paid the price in full, it is not inconsistent to urge people to count the cost of entering the kingdom. That is, in fact, the very point Jesus is making in these two brief parables recorded in Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 46. He urges all who would enter the kingdom to consider what it will cost them. What is the cost to a sinner who enters God's kingdom? Hidden Treasure The first parable is so simple, it is contained in a single verse. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. A story that simple implies that Jesus was dealing with familiar imagery. The hearers would understand the legal and cultural context with no explanation. But for us, some background is necessary. Let's start with a recent and strikingly similar story that went viral on the Internet in February 2014. A Northern California couple were walking their dog on their own property when they spotted something beginning to emerge from under the dirt of the pathway. It was a corroded tin can that had been buried years before. Digging it up, they found more cans, all containing gold coins, more than 1,400 coins total, valued at more than $10 million. The coins had been minted in San Francisco at various times between 1847 and 1894 dates that span the California Gold Rush era. One particularly rare coin in the collection was valued at more than a million dollars. It was believed to be the most valuable hidden treasure ever uncovered in the United States. Most of the network news reports covering the story stressed the fact that the odds of winning the lottery are several thousand times better than the chance of finding such a rare treasure. Hiding treasure in a field was perhaps more common in our Lord's day than it is today. 
People today put their money in the savings and loan, or invest in stocks, bonds, securities, or real estate. Other valuables are typically locked away in safe deposit boxes. In Jesus' time, money changers and money lenders operated in connection with the temple rather than in banks, and they did not offer safe places to store one's wealth. Wealth was typically tied up in land and possessions. Only the extremely rich would have a surplus of coins, jewels, or other valuable treasure, and it was up to the individual who owned such a cash to find a way to hide it. In lands where wars and political upheavals were fairly common events, burying one's riches was a convenient means of protecting the family wealth. Conquering armies always believed they were entitled to the spoils of war. Some took this as a right to steal, loot, and plunder from local inhabitants. If a battle was on the horizon, a prudent person might take whatever jewelry or money was kept in the house, bury it in an earthen jar, and remember the place so it could be retrieved when the danger was over. Josephus wrote about the aftermath of Jerusalem's destruction by Rome under Titus Vespasian in A.D. 70. No small quantity of the riches that had been in that city were still found among its ruins, a great deal of which the Romans dug up, but the greatest part was discovered by those who were captives, and so they carried it away. I mean the gold and the silver, and the rest of that most precious furniture which the Jews had, and which the owners had treasured up underground, against the uncertain fortunes of war. People sometimes buried valuables out of craven fear, distrust, or slothfulness. Jesus makes reference to this in Matthew chapter 25, verse 18, where one of his parables describes a lazy steward who dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money, rather than investing it or putting it to work for some profitable purpose. He should have at least returned the money with interest, Jesus said. Burying it, when he had the opportunity to earn something with it, was foolish and unfaithful. We'll examine that parable in chapter 7. So here is a man who discovers a buried treasure in a field that belongs to someone else. He might have been employed by the owner of the field to cultivate the land. As he is plowing, he unearths a buried treasure. Immediately he puts it back where he found it. Then he goes and sells everything he possesses in the world, liquidates all that he has, and buys that field in order that he may gain the treasure hidden in it. We are not told precisely what the treasure was, only that it was immensely valuable. Readers sometimes wonder if what the man did was ethical. He discovers a treasure that does not belong to him, then buries it again without telling the person who owned the field. Did he not have a duty to report his finding to the landowner? He did not. Jewish rabbinic law was very specific about such things. When an object of value whose owner was unknown was found outdoors, even just outside the threshold of the house, the landowner had no necessary claim to it. Here's a sample from a modern collection of ancient sources. If he found an object between the boards at the thresholds of the doorway to the house, if the object was located from the door jam and outward, it belongs to the finder. If it was located from the door jam and inward, it belongs to the householder. If one found an object in a hole or new wall, if the object was located from the midpoint and outward, it belongs to the finder. If the object was located from the midpoint and inward toward the inside of the house, it belongs to the householder. If the wall or hole was open wholly outward, even if the object was located from the midpoint toward the inside of the house, it belongs to the finder. If the wall or hole was open wholly inward, even if the object was located from the midpoint toward the outside of the house, it belongs to the householder. The treasure found in the field clearly did not belong to the landowner. If it had been his, he would have dug it up before selling his field to someone else. The fact that he didn't know it was there meant he had no prior right to it. 
Therefore, by Jewish law, it belonged to the finder. If the man who found the treasure had been less than scrupulous, he might have simply grabbed it and split. Or he could have simply taken part of the treasure and used it to buy the field containing the rest of the stash. He didn't do that. Nor did he unnecessarily provoke a debate about who the rightful owner was. He simply took the treasure he had found and put it right back in the ground. Then he sold everything he had on the face of the earth and bought the entire field just so that he would have undisputed ownership of that treasure. That is the point of the parable. A man found something so valuable that he sold everything he owned in order to get it. He was so overjoyed, so overwhelmed by the value of his discovery, that he was eager to surrender everything he had in order to gain that treasure. The Pearl of Great Price The second parable makes the same point. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Matthew chapter 13, verses 45 through 46. This man was likely a wholesaler. The word for merchant is imporos in the Greek text. It is the same word from which the English emporium is derived. He would travel from city to city, searching through markets, fishing ports, trade fairs, looking for high-grade pearls to buy for resale. People do the same thing nowadays with antiques. They search through old barns and attics and attend estate sales, hoping to find among all the second-hand furniture an overlooked treasure that they can pick up at a bargain. In Jesus' time, pearls were the equivalent of diamonds today. Well-formed pearls were as valuable as any precious gem. Pearls also made wealth very portable. If you had fine pearls, you owned a fortune. Freedivers working without scuba masks, wetsuits, proper weights, or breathing apparatus would gather them from dangerous depths in the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf, and the Indian Ocean. Many died in such dives. Pearl divers would tie rocks to their bodies, take one long, deep breath, jump off the side of a boat, and scour the bottom mud for oysters. A single pearl of perfection, size, and beauty could be of immense value. When Jesus said, Do not cast your pearls before a swine, Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, he was painting an absurd word picture to illustrate the folly of attempting to reason with people who clearly have nothing but contempt for the truth. Who would ever expect the lowest of unclean brute beasts to appreciate something as valuable as pearls? This merchant sought fine pearls to sell because they were a reliable investment. They increased in value as time went by. As is true today, wise investors would diversify, put some money in the ground, some in pearls, some in real estate. The one thing smart investors did not typically do was put everything into one commodity. In light of that, it is significant that in both of these parables, the main characters did precisely what most savvy investment advisors would strongly warn us against. The first man sold everything and bought one field. The second man sold everything and bought one pearl. Six Vital Truths About the Kingdom these two simple parables are not about principles of investment. They make a point that is spiritual. Everything this world deems worthwhile or important counts as sheer loss compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ and being part of his kingdom. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 8. That one point summarizes several underlying lessons about the kingdom that are woven into these parables. First, is a truth we have touched on already. The kingdom is priceless in value. In Christ and his kingdom, we have an eternal treasure that is rich beyond comparison. This treasure is incorruptible, undefiled, unfading, eternal, and reserved in heaven for believers. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Both parables feature a fortune of incomparable value that represents the kingdom of God. Keep in mind how we have defined the kingdom. 
It is that realm where Christ graciously rules over and eternally blesses willing, loving subjects who gladly embrace him as Lord by faith. It is the realm of salvation. Christ is the undisputed sovereign here, and his glory is the kingdom's centerpiece. That alone would be sufficient to establish the kingdom's infinite value, but that's not all. The kingdom consists of everything that is eternal, everything that has true and intrinsic value, everything that is permanently incorruptible and undefiled. Everything else will pass away, while the blessedness of the kingdom can never fade or diminish. Indeed, of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7. To paraphrase a favorite hymn, the peace of the kingdom is perfect, but it flows fuller every day. Perfect, but it grows deeper all the way. The kingdom is a heavenly treasure lying in the field of this poverty-stricken, bankrupt, accursed world. It is a prize sufficient to make every one of earth's poor, miserable, blind, sinful inhabitants immeasurably rich for all eternity. The treasure includes salvation, forgiveness, love, joy, peace, virtue, goodness, glory, eternal life in heaven, the presence of God under his smile, and Christ himself. Literally, everything of eternal value is encompassed in the treasure of the kingdom. That is why this is the most valuable commodity that can ever be found, and only an absolute fool would be unwilling to relinquish everything he owns to gain it. A second lesson here. The kingdom is not superficially visible. The treasure was hidden. The pearl had to be sought. They weren't obvious to the casual observer. That's exactly like the parables themselves. The true meaning is not immediately manifest. It's there for those who seek it. But it is not prominent and unmistakable, so that someone whose interest is merely tepid will take notice. Likewise, Jesus said the kingdom of God does not come with fanfare. Most pay no attention to it whatsoever. Luke chapter 17, verse 20. Spiritual realities cannot be naturally perceived and are therefore not appreciated in any way by unregenerate humanity. No one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Verse 14. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John chapter 3, verse 3. So the kingdom and its true worth remain hidden from carnal minds. That's why the treasure of salvation is not highly esteemed or ever even discovered by most. After all, the carnal mind is enmity against God. Romans chapter 8, verse 7. That also explains why worldly people don't understand or appreciate why Christians are passionate about the glory of God. They don't understand why we prize the kingdom of heaven so highly when it means nothing to them. Unregenerate people simply have no sense of what divine glory entails. They cannot fathom why someone would willingly submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. They don't understand why anyone would repudiate sin and its pleasures in order to pursue righteousness, sacrificing earthly delights for heavenly joys. That goes against every instinct and every desire of the fallen human heart. People are quite simply blind to the riches of the kingdom. Scripture says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of those who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Christ, who is the light of the world, was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. John chapter 1, verses 10 through 11. To a large degree, that explains the moral deterioration of our culture today. Sinners are not naturally inclined to seek God. In fact, Scripture says, There is none who seeks after God. Romans chapter 3, verse 11. But only those who do seek will find. And those who do seek 
do so because God graciously draws them to Christ. John chapter 6, verse 44. Not dragging them against their will, but drawing them with gentle cords with bands of love. Hosea chapter 11, verse 4. He invites and urges all to seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6. And Christ himself promises, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 8. Here's the third lesson from these two parables. The kingdom is personally appropriated. The key figure in both parables is an individual. Each finds something of great value specifically for himself and appropriates it. The imagery is vital because Jesus was teaching people who were prone to think because they were part of national Israel. They were automatically members of the Messiah's kingdom. Likewise, lots of people think that because they were baptized, attend church, or even formally join the membership of a church. That is what gives them entrance to Christ's kingdom. It is even theologically trendy today to think of people coming into the kingdom collectively, rather than as individuals, because their tribe, nation, or clan formally associates with some form of Christianity. Not so. They are not all Israel who are of Israel. Romans chapter 9, verse 6. He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit. Romans chapter 2, verses 28 through 29. You are not yet a citizen of the kingdom of heaven until you have personally been brought into union with Christ by the Spirit of God, and thereby appropriated the treasure for yourself. The fruit and necessary proof of that union is true love for Christ, surrender to His authority, and a wholehearted trust in Him as both Lord and Savior. If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22. You are listening to Second Chance Ministry Radio.